Okay. Good evening, everyone. I am Angela Nash, and I am the chairperson of the Safety and Security Committee, and I serve as vice chair on the Richland 2 School Board. And I am so excited to have you all here tonight. This is our first Parent Academy basically community academy event that we're having this year and I am super excited for you all to be here and it's a really good turnout and that makes me very very happy because we're all joining in together on this path of learning more about how we can keep our young ones safe and so tonight we are fortunate to have experts from Richland County Sheriff's Department and dare with us to provide insights and answers to your questions and your presence shows that you guys have a commitment to safety and the health of our young ones so I'm excited to use this opportunity to learn engage and empower ourselves to protect our children from hidden threats so but before we get started I'm not going to do it like it's the Emmys but I do want to thank some people I want to thank our entire committee I know that Miss Denise Rivers just came in she serves on that as one of our parent representatives Mr. McGee Moody couldn't be here tonight but he also does Mr. Will Epps our teacher of the year um, Miss Ladia Williams is here Miss LaShonda McFadden who serves as one of our board representatives Dr. Scott couldn't be here tonight um, but there's so many people all the students who serve uh, to our communications team, Ms. Tanidra and administration and Dr. Moore for basically helping us get this, this, get this together. We couldn't do it. It takes a team and a village. And so I'm just thankful for our Richland 2 community village that has helped us make this happen. So our first speaker tonight will be Dr. Ashley Fraser, Fraser, and she is the Director of Curriculum and Training for Dear America. And then our second speaker will be Ms. Tara Moore, Drug Identification Technical Leader at Richland County Sheriff's Department. So thank you for your participation. And I'm excited for the informative and enlightening things we're going to hear tonight. Hello, I'm Ashley Fraser. Um, thank you so much for having me here. I am going to speak to this. Parents are primary prevention partners. I'm going to not bury the lead. I'm going to tell you right now that the way that you are prevention partners is through your presence. And your presence right here can help you remember that because you're here. The opposite of a hidden danger um, is a um, showing up, right, for safety. And you've done that by being here, so it's a wonderful start. Sometimes we tend to think about prevention as something maybe that belongs to experts at school, experts in healthcare, but in fact parents um, there are multiple layers of prevention work best, and parents are really that most continuous presence for kids. And I'm going to flesh out what that presence might look like. I'm also going to use my notes because I can be a little bit of a rambler, and I promised that I would let Tara have plenty of time to give you the lowdown on substances because she's a, a good um, sciencey person to give you the important stuff about cannabis and other drugs, so I'm going to stick to it. So my work is as a prevention scientist, and my job here today is to help you understand how as parents you play a critical role as one of the primary partners in helping your kids um, get skills that will prevent them from making decisions and engaging behaviors that put them at risk. And now the foundational skills that help kids safe from substance use help keep them safe from all kinds of risk behaviors. So the good news is what I'm going to um, talk about today keeps your kids safe in lots of different ways. And again, that's primarily your presence. And we'll talk about some of the main ways that that works. But, oh, clicker. Is this working? What do I point to? <laughs> I don't know what I'm pointing to with it. I'm not sure that it's turned on. First, oh, first sure. of all. Sorry. Try this one. Oh, thank you. There we go. Why prevention? So one of the things that people sometimes wonder is why we focus on the big picture of prevention so much. It's kind of a vague word, and a lot of times people think, well, could we just set some firm rules and then enforce them, um, right? So if, let's set some rules, let's 
have real consequences that matter if kids break the rules. And I do think that's actually part of the big picture of prevention, but it's so much more than that. And if you remember like years ago, even 40 years ago when D.A.R.E. began, that was what prevention looked like. Does anybody remember the Just Say No campaigns? <laughs> and how well they worked for you? <laughs> Just Say No is one message, but it isn't the only message. Human behavior is complex, and the groundwork for how decision making around behavior and risk is laid happens long before um, the situations that come up happen. So we need to start long before um, just saying no or rule setting happens with kids building the skills they need to be able to make complicated decisions around risk. And one of the skills, um, or one of the reasons that happens is that the age of onset matters. One of the most important things we know about substance use is that we need prevention efforts to begin long before the age of onset. This is the age where kids might first try or be tempted to try or ask to try a substance. Um, we know that early use is dangerous. Kids who use early are more likely to use more and to keep using later in life. Delaying that first age of trying or use is important. More developed brains make better decisions more developed brains are less at risk for addiction and are less affected by some substances. Delaying use gives kids a chance to think of themselves as non-users. We think of the typical age of onset for the big three things, which I'll talk about, to be around seventh or eighth grade. But in fact, 67% of kids um, have never tried alcohol, nicotine, or any other drug at the age of eighth grade. 67%, most kids. So as kids make life transition, they develop identities and fall into peer groups, activities, and adopt behaviors that align with these identities, right? So if they understand that the norm is non-use and they feel comfortable with that identity, they're gonna make friends, right? Develop behaviors and feel comfortable in that identity. So we wanna support understanding that. We don't wanna have the attitude that all kids are doing this or have our kids adopt that attitude. We wanna give them time by delaying that age of onset, to feel comfortable in that identity of non-use, right? So delaying onset has a, a bi-directional effect, also developing reinforcing protective factors that supports continuing non-use. The longer you go in life without using, the better chance you're gonna feel comfortable in that identity and continue not to be a user. Parents have a significant influence. I know it doesn't always feel like it, Sometimes it feels like your kids aren't listening, but remember that this is a way that kids also develop their identities. Part of the developmental um, process is kids trying to differentiate themselves from you. Um, remembering that their parents and families are different people and that their behavior um, sometimes feels like they're pushing you away. But we remember also that they are listening and their consistent presence and messaging becomes part of their identity and worldview for good or for bad. So having a consistent message, um, consistent messages about your family's values, how you feel about things like risk and substances, having those messages over and over, being a steady presence, having a steady um, uh, presence in their lives and, and openness to hearing from them um, matters to them, even though it may not seem like it in the moment. You are a significant, and research has shown that those values come back to kids and it, and it does matter to them. So some of the big dangers I wanna talk about. Tara's gonna to talk to you specifically about substances, but I'm gonna cover some big picture things. First, the big three things. Substances most likely to be used first and early. Alcohol, tobacco products, and marijuana. They're also the most likely to be used later in life as well. Um, for the past several years, tobacco use was trending down, even decades, because cigarette smoking was the primary way that um, young people and older people ingested uh, tobacco. However, in the last couple of years, it's trended back up. How come? Vaping. Vaping. Now that we are using tobacco products in a different way, now that trend has trended upward back a little bit, uh, more than a little bit. Um, Non-medical prescription drug use is also a growing problem among adolescents. Um, and this one is a, 
a bad one because it has sometimes deadly consequences due to adulteration with fentanyl and other synthetics. Tara, I'm sure we'll talk to you about that as well. I'm gonna talk a little about prevalence, um, not a lot, but I, I do want you to know something, because I like to, as a prevention specialist, remind you that the news is not all terrible, because fear is not always the best way to come at your kids. Remember just say no, right? Um, we wanna be realistic and let them be okay with the norm that a lot of kids are making good decisions and we want our kids to be one of those many kids making good decisions. Um, some things that might surprise you, if you look at this chart, the one on the left, what it's showing you is alcohol and tobacco trends from 1992. That's the year I graduated from high school. So all the way over on the left is 1992 and all the way over on the right of that left hand chart is 2022. You'll notice a mostly downward trend from about 40% the year I graduated from high school for kids who say they've drank alcohol to 20% in 2022 of kids who say they've used it. That's half, right? And by kids, I mean 8th, 10th, and 12th graders combined. So when I was in high school, 40% of those kids said that they had used alcohol. Now 20. 20% 20 to 10% for tobacco. That's the second line. The red one is have been drunk before. Also cut in half from 20 to 10%. If you look at this chart on the right, this one is showing marijuana all the way back to the 70s. If you look at the blue on that one, marijuana use peaked in, who can guess what year? 1978. <laughs> was anyone in high school that year? The peak of marijuana use was 1978. 50% of um, grades 8, 10, and 12 said that they were using marijuana in that year. It trended downward for a while, and then it rose again in the 90s to 40%, but it's never again been at a level that high. You'll see that it has not continued to trend downward, though. It trended downward, it peaked again a little in the 90s, and then it's kind of been steady-ish since then. I show you this because sometimes we get scared, right? That things are getting worse and worse. That substance use is getting worse and worse. That all kids are using drugs, that it's hopeless. That really is not true. And it's dangerous to have that attitude because when kids believe that everybody is doing something and it's normalized for them, then what do they do? Kids want to fit in. They do the thing that we say and they believe that everyone's doing. It's important to have the accurate norm, which is most kids are not doing it. However, as parents, what I want you to remember is the idea of experimentation has changed dramatically. The drugs that are available today are extremely different than the drugs that were available in the 70s or even the 90s. And there's no experimenting safely or it's just a phase. Today, uh, many of the drugs that are available to kids, even weed, is super different than it was even 10 or 15 or 20 years ago. And um, one pill can kill is a DEA um, campaign because of adulteration. And um, even the THC level in marijuana is wildly different than it looked like a generation to, ago. So. Um, although the trend is down, if kids use these um, substances, it's a very serious problem. Substance use occurs almost exclusively with kids that they know, with um, friends in a social context, and they try whatever they can get their hands on. So let me say that again. For kids, substance use is almost always initially tried with friends and with whatever they can get their hands on. So what do you hear in that? Lots of things under your control, right? It's very important as parents to remember you can control some of the factors in this equation. Know who your kids are hanging out with, right? Be careful about what's available. So I'm gonna go through some of the, these um, in a few slides. Another important thing to remember there's a bi-directional relationship 
between mental health problems and substance use. Kids are more likely to try substances to meet normal human needs, like fitting in, feeling better, relieving stress, relieving anxiety. Those are normal human needs. Do you ever feel stress or anxiety? Do you want to feel like you fit in? Do you want to feel better when you feel bad? Yeah. Those are human needs that every person has. There's nothing wrong with kids for wanting those things. The problem is they are using a dysfunctional strategy for meeting that need. That's what we need to help them with. We need to be noticing when children are struggling and helping them with those needs. We need to help them find healthy ways to cope and we need to help them get the help that they actually need. If we don't, they will seek out ways to cope with whatever they can figure out on their own. And their friends will help them figure out how to cope with whatever ways their friends have found to cope, right? So that's um, an underlying problem is that if we leave our kids to struggle or we go, I don't know what to do to help them, we gotta figure that, that is a parental responsibility, right? Figure out how to help our kids to cope. Now, you can get someone to help you. You don't have to figure it out on your own, but we gotta figure it out with our kids because otherwise we are n neglecting to help them find healthy ways to cope and this is something that can cause them to be more likely to use substances. And here's the issue. If they do, it very often will make whatever problem they were struggling with worse. Because now, layered on top of that initial problem they were having, they, have, they may have shame that they're doing something bad. They may have fear that they're going to get caught. They may get caught and get in trouble. They may need to hide it, right? So now you're layering more and more problems on top. And um, this is why you call it a bi or reciprocal problem. Um, mental health problems can increase the risk for substance use, and the substance use can increase the problem of the mental health. So what can parents do? I've sort of touched on some of these, so I'm going to go through them quite quickly. You are a prevention partner in these ways. You can talk, talk to your kids, talk specifically about your family's norms and values. If that feels awkward to you, keep doing it. Your kids want to know how you feel about things. They want clarity on what you believe, um, what your opinions are. Um, that kind of in, that kind of important clarity for them can help them not only find their way and guidance about what they believe, but it can give them something um, to stand on sort of when they go out in the world. Talk to them directly about risk, directly about decision making. Um, talk to them about substance use and what your expectations are. Be careful about what kind of jokes you're cracking or funny stories you're telling. Um, if you tell them with approval, they may be getting signals, right, about what's okay for you. Also, the other part of talking in a conversation is listening. Remember that it's a two-way street. Your talk um, is important to your kid if you also are listening. Um, try to listen calmly. Sometimes your kid is going to say things that you don't agree with. They may ask for things that you feel offended by. They may ask for things that are outside of your family norms and values. That doesn't mean you have to agree to it or say yes. But the fact that you listen and have a conversation um, about why you don't agree and hear them out calmly is very important. Kids that feel shut down and not able to talk about what they want, need, or um, have their opinions heard out are um, less and less likely to come to you and talk to you about what their problems are. So remembering to have that open door for them to come and talk to you about hard things is very important. Um, again, when their perspective differs from you, always come back to your family's values, norms, and expectations. Um, you, you don't always ha have to compromise. Listening and hearing a different opinion doesn't mean you have to stray from your family's values and expectations. It just means you're listening to something different. Um, especially listen to talk about their mental health and their peers' uh, values and culture because you want to be listening for that. Remember what we said about being like your peers. Um, you want to listen for talk about 
um, peer culture that differs from yours. Um, again, presence, keeping that good relationship open, a relationship where your kid can come to you. I don't want to call anybody out, but are you home? Are you on your device all the time? We are now a generation where we used to call kids out for being on their devices all the time. Are we on our device all the time? <laughs> or can our kid actually get our focus time and presence? Try to be aware of it. Also uncomfortable, monitoring and supervision. No child is going to admit this to you, but having rules and monitoring. Don't just set the rule, but monitor whether it's being followed and have consequences if it isn't that you actually follow through on. It's all hard, but having that set of guardrails for life is important and it helps kids learn to self-regulate and it can be their out. No matter how much they complain about rules, when they're out there in the world and something comes up, being able to say, my mom checks my phone, man. <laughs> my dad will drop by here and see if I'm here. Is sometimes the excuse not to do the wrong thing. All right. Re oh, I skipped one. No, I didn't. Um, Sometimes going by the house is how you know who your kids are hanging out with. That chart just shows you um, the relationship between are your friends using this substance and are you. Kids who say most of my kids smoke weed, that other line is showing you do you smoke weed. Most of my friends drink, do you drink. Their relationship is very close. Very close. Have you ever heard that thing like, you are your five best friends, <laughs> that thing. It's, when it comes to substances, it's very, very true. There's very rarely one kid hanging out with a bunch of other kids who doesn't do any of the things they do. It's not always, but with substances, it's usually very close. Family environment, availability, and attitudes. Again, I don't want anyone to feel called out, but if substances are regularly used at home, Attitudes about use are lenient or positive, and substances are available to kids in the home, they're much more likely to use them. Remember before when we said first use is often with friends and whatever they can get their hands on? If there are a lot of substances, whether it's alcohol, weed, pills, whatever, at the house, they can get them, and they will, right? Even if it's just taking a couple out every few days and put them in the pocket, getting a couple of beers. If they're there, and if attitudes are, it's cool. Um, they will, whether they're sneaking or whether they're doing it openly. And it's not to say your kid is a bad kid, but when they're in this phase of exper experimentation, the more things are available, the more chances there are that they're gonna end up using them. So again, it goes back to monitoring, supervision, open relationships. And finally, um, learn and reinforce. As a partner, I really mean partner, multi-layered approaches to prevention are the thing. The more kids hear um, consistent messaging in multiple contexts, the more important it is. So if you have DARE or an SRO in your school that delivers some kind of prevention programming, um, try to know what it is. Whether that's asking your kids for conversation around the dinner table about what they learned at school, whether it's any kind of take-homes that come home, whether it's health class and you look at the homework or digital send-homes, um, understanding what your kid is learning or hearing in their environment about prevention, and then echoing that language at home or having conversations, it's really effective. Or even if it's somewhere else, if it's at the library, if it's at a religious community, having those conversations so that those same messages get echoed over and over again um, it's really effective. Um, it's also useful if you um, ask your kid to repeat, you know, things that they know or you've talked about because repetition is important for them. So having kids talk about the things that they already know, it's just kind of a back and forth. And if you ever just want to know more about prevention, all of our federal agencies, if you go to NIH, you can get to NIDA, the National Institute for Drug Abuse, or um, NIAAA, the National Institute for Alcohol, um, through our 
you know, those federal resources because they're free, they're current, they have parent conversation leads on all of those. If you go to um, SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health, you know. So any of our federal resources, just big picture, are always things I would recommend to go to because they all have parent guides and you know they're up to date. That's what your tax dollars are paying for. And they do a pretty good job of providing parent resources. Or you can always email me, ashley.fraser at dare.org. I'll make sure that gets shared and I can point you in the right direction for info. I don't have a timer, so I hope I stay on time. Yes, we're, we're going to do a Q&A after we both talk. Thank you. We're getting it switched over, so I'll just go ahead and introduce myself um, while I get that rolling. My name is Tara Moore. I'm the Drug Identification Technical Leader at the Richland County Sheriff's Department Forensic Sciences Laboratory. It's a mouthful. Basically, I supervise all of the drug chemists in that section. So we test all of the seized drug evidence that the officers submit um, for examination, and we determine what's actually in those substances. So most of what I'm presenting to you today comes from actual tests that we've done on actual evidence items um, that we've analyzed. So you'll kind of get um, a little insider perspective on what we're actually seeing here in South Carolina. This isn't all over the country. This isn't in another region. This is here in our backyard. Um, so <clears throat> I'm originally from Washington State. Um, my background in education is chemistry. Um, I've been with the Sheriff's Department now for almost 16 years, um, the entire time in the drug chemistry section. So I've seen a lot of drug trends come and go, um, seen a lot of unique designer um, drugs is what we call them, um, new emerging substances um, over the years. So hopefully we'll get to talk about some of those. <clears throat> I didn't put, just as a little disclaimer, I didn't put anything about opioids in this particular presentation. This is going to focus mostly on cannabis and some of the cannabis products, but if you have a question about some of the opioids that are out there, um, please feel free to ask that at the end of the Q&A session, and I'd be happy to speak to those um, as well. All right, it works. So this is sort of just generally what we're gonna go over. <clears throat> I wanna to talk to you a little bit about scheduling criteria because I think it's important for you to understand how substances become regulated or controlled or made illegal, um, how they're identified, and then just some general criteria that the um, Drug Enforcement Administration uses when they're determining where to place those different substances. We're also gonna talk a little bit about marijuana. I know um, it's a pretty old topic, but um, like Ashley alluded to, things have changed a lot over the years. The marijuana today is not the marijuana from years ago. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that. And then I do wanna get into some of the derivatives um, because marijuana is sort of ground zero of a lot of these other products that are now emerging. Um, so we will get into some of the um, derivatives, the hash, hash oil, the concentrates, the vapes, and then of course some of the edibles as well. At the end, I'm gonna to touch on some of the specific dangers attributed to these products. Um, problems with dosage and then some of the effects also. And then I will touch on some of the other non-cannabis edibles that you might not be aware of as well. So, off we go. So the Federal Controlled Substances Act is um, overseen by the Drug Enforcement Administration, which is part of the US Department of Justice. So they're responsible for identifying substances and chemicals that are potentially hazardous to the pop public um, and then determining if those substances should or need to be controlled or regulated to some degree. So this is a very extensive process. This is not just a willy-nilly, hey, this is out there, let's control it. 
let's make it illegal. So it's an extensive process. It goes through a public comment period um, and lots of other steps before it ever gets to this point. Once they've determined that a substance should be regulated or controlled, there's a set of criteria that they use, and I have it listed there, that they consider when deciding where to place that drug, essentially, in that controlled status. So they look at if it's got any currently accepted medical use. If it has a legitimate medical use, it's gonna be placed lower in the scheduling. They also look at the substance's relative potential for abuse. Um, so if it's something that um, is very popular that has a high potential for abuse, it's gonna be placed higher in the schedules. And then third, the likelihood of this substance causing some sort of dependence. Um, and this dependence, we'll touch on a little bit later also, can be physical or psychological dependence. Um, a lot of people only think of the physical um, addiction and not the mental aspect of it as well. So just keep that in your brain as we move through this. So the schedules go one through five. One is the highest schedule. Five is the lowest. Some examples, marijuana is actually in a schedule one. So the highest schedule. Um, <clears throat> Two are, um, so I will say, Schedule Ones have no legitimate medical use as recognized by the federal government. So other substances in the Schedule One would be things like heroin, LSD, MDMA, um, the psilocybin or psilocin that comes from the mushrooms, also a Schedule One. Things in a little bit lower, just as an example, cocaine is actually a Schedule Two. Not sure if you knew that it actually has a legitimate medical use. Very narrow therapeutic window, but it does have a legitimate medical use. Um, same with methamphetamine, actually. So those are in Schedule 2. They have medical use, but they have a high potential for abuse and dependence, so they're still pretty high up there. Anyway, that's kind of how that works. So when we come to marijuana, like I mentioned, federally it is still considered a Schedule I substance. Lots of states have legalized it both um, for medical use and recreational use. South Carolina is not one of them yet. So in South Carolina and federally, cannabis sativa, marijuana, is still a Schedule I substance, illegal. Um, I do want to go through this. I know. Probably all of you have your own opinions, um, convictions about marijuana, um, what it is, what it isn't, but just so that we're all on the same page and kind of using the same terminology as we're looking at some of these substances, I do just want to go through some of the basics, um, just so that we're all, again, singing from the same sheet of music. So marijuana <clears throat> is typically the leaves, buds, um, flowers, of the cannabis sativa plant. They're typically dried and then smoked, similar to tobacco. The primary psychoactive substance in marijuana that's responsible for producing the high is a chemical called delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol, THC. It's a lot easier to say. There are lots of THC isomers in the marijuana plant, but that's the one in particular that um, is most abundant and most responsible for producing the effects um, caused by marijuana. Um, the THC, Delta-9, is found in the resin that's secreted from the plant. So if you think about a flower, flowers secrete sticky substances, why? To capture pollen, right? That fertilizes the flower. Um, same thing with the marijuana plant. So the flowers and the buds of the marijuana plant secrete the resin to capture the pollen um, to fertilize the flower. That resin is where the Delta 9 THC is found. Um, so that's the part of the plant that people are interested in because that's where the compound of interest is. However, the marijuana, like Ashley alluded to, today is much, much, much more potent than even 10 years ago, 20 years ago, and so on. Um, and we're gonna talk a little about that. I do wanna mention here also, um, South Carolina, the Department of Agriculture, has um, implemented 
the Hemp Farming Act, which has legalized the production of hemp or cultivation of hemp as an agricultural product. Hemp and marijuana come from the exact same plant. There's one primary difference. Hemp plants are specifically grown or cultivated to have a very low THC content. So by definition, hemp is cannabis sativa L with a delta 9 THC percent of less than 0 0.3. 0 0.3, that is almost nothing. Um, and the next slide you're gonna see, um, we're gonna talk about the potency of marijuana and it's off the charts. So, here we go. Traditionally, historically, in the 60s and 70s era, marijuana contained approximately one to three percent delta-9 THC. So, relatively low. Um, <clears throat> Around 2015-ish, cultivation techniques um, got a little bit better. Um, seed hybrid, hybridization got a little bit better. So from there on, we've seen improvements in the marijuana products that are being um, cultivated and produced. So presently, we're seeing THC percentages in plant material averaging 15 to 20%, averaging. Those are samples that I have tested in our laboratory over the last few years, 15 to 20%. That's a 10, 15, 20 times fold increase from the marijuana back in the day, right? This is not the Cheech and Chong kind of up in smoke deal. This is much, much, much more potent. Um, a lot of the misconceptions about marijuana also have been traditionally that it's not addictive, that um, nobody has died from it, so it's not really dangerous. Um, those have changed and are changing dramatically because of the increased potencies that we're seeing, not just in plant material. You'll see when we get to some of the extracts and concentrates, those percentages are even higher. Um, so we are seeing um, some different clinical diagnoses now coming from marijuana use. So one of them is now tagged cannabis use disorder. Um, and I have the definition there. It's basically characterized by a continued problematic pattern of use despite negative consequences that causes significant distress or impairment of function. There's also a couple others down there. These are more physical symptoms, the last two that I have listed there. So um, causing severe vomiting um, and other psychosis. We've seen several hospitalizations now from these products um, because these are chemicals, remember. Chemicals alter your brain chemistry, especially for adolescents, that's very dangerous. Um, their bodies are not developed, their brains are not developed, and um, these have devastating effects on um, immature adults, as well as mature adults, but particularly with youth. Um, we're seeing psychosis that I mentioned, which is sort of a disconnect from reality, not to mention the physical symptoms, um, and the cannabis use disorder actually has a series of criteria that they use for categorization, and some of those criteria are withdrawal symptoms. So that sort of speaks to, well, it's not addictive. It is, it is. If there is withdrawal happening, whether it's physical or um, psychological, that's withdrawal. That means there's a habit forming and it's an addiction. Um, <clears throat> so I just want you to understand that. One of the things that I always, always try to stress, especially to parents, is like Ashley mentioned, teach, please, 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 teach your kids coping skills, healthy coping skills. They're going to encounter disappointment, rejection, grief, all of those things. It's part of life. Teach them how to deal with that in a healthy way, how to talk about it, how to process it. 
Otherwise, they're gonna look for other ways to deal with that. And a lot of times, it's substance abuse. And like Ashley mentioned, it just layers upon layers upon layers. The hole gets deeper. So if I can stress anything to you, please teach your kids healthy coping skills. All right. <clears throat> so plant material, we're seeing in the 15 to 20% um, potency range. Let's talk about extracts and concentrates. So this is essentially taking that plant material and then separating it from that resin that I talked about where that um, THC is present. So there's some different ways to do it. A mechanical extraction would be sort of like sieving the material, grinding it up, and then separating the leafy plant material from the actual resin. Um, that's typically referred to as hashish. It can be pressed into cakes. It's kind of representative of that top picture up there, that sort of block of uh, brown material. You can also separate that, ex that uh, resin from the plant material by doing a solvent extraction. So essentially taking a chemical and dissolving that resin away from the plant material and then evaporating that solvent up. Thank you. And then you're left with just that concentrated THC. So um, some of the different sort of slang terms that you might have heard that referred to, dabs, wax, shatter, um, BHO is butane honey oil, butane being the specific solvent that they're using to um, separate that resin from the plant material. Um, <clears throat> a lot of these methods use chemicals which can also leave trace residue behind. So now that solvent residue and other chemicals are being left in your finished product. Some of the reason why the vape pens are so, so devastating is because of the chemical contamination in the concentrates. So not only do you get that from the extraction process, you can also get that as additives, things that they're adding to those concentrates to get them into the right type of form to be usable in that vape pen or um, other device. Um, I will just outright say this, vaping is not safer than smoking. It's just not. Um, four mentions, four reasons that I've mentioned. I don't know if you remember back in 2019 or 2020, there was a big thing in the news about all of the vaping, um, people getting really, really sick um, hospitalized from vaping. It was because a lot of the vapes um, had vitamin E acetate added to them as a way to help metabolize the THC once it was in the body. They didn't realize that essentially vaporizing vitamin E and putting that directly onto your lungs would cause such devastating effects. But there's actually, it's EVALI, it stands for ESIG Vaping Associated Lung Injury. And they found it in a lot of young adolescents and teens because the vaping was really popular in that demographic, causing extensive lung damage, even more so than smoking regular cigarettes. Um, a highly diminished lung function, um, so even doing relatively Simple movements or exercises, um, just really, really out of breath, short of breath, feel like they're suffocating because their lungs aren't functioning. One um, clinician actually made a statement about a patient saying it looked like there was an oil spill in her lungs. Yeah. Um, inflammation, pulmonary hemorrhage, these are all things um, caused by vaping. So I know there's, there's definitely sort of this premise out there that, you know, vaping is safe, you're not burning anything like the paper on the cigarette, you're not inhaling those carcinogens, so it's safer. That is absolutely not the case. So I will also say all of these extracts are also illegal. 
So anything that's derived from the marijuana plant um, containing Delta 9 THC is illegal. Um, so I'll leave the vaping there. We'll move on to the edibles. Um, so essentially they're taking these concentrates, they can put them in vape pens um, to be uh, ingested or inhaled that way, or you can also take the concentrates and go the other direction um, to produce edibles. And so that's kind of where we're gonna go next. So I'll just give you a second to take it all in. Um, <clears throat> you'll notice a lot of the packaging materials, right, they're manufactured to look similar to legitimate snacks and candies. So they're very colorful, they have um, punny little, you know, marketing slogans on them. A lot of them look very similar to legitimate candies, like this um, Sour Patch Kids up top. Um, one of the things, <coughs> before we even get into what's actually in them, these can be very dangerous because small kids can't read the packaging, right? It looks like the real thing. So if little kids get a hold of these, they're not gonna know that it's anything different from the candy that they're used to having. Um, and I will say, unfortunately, these get left around people's homes all the time. So they're not even careful about keeping them away from children and pets. I will add pets also um, to that. They're marketed to young children and young adults to be appealing, right? They know their market. Um, <clears throat> a lot of the, the edibles specifically that we see also, um, I kind of highlighted it in the yellow circles down there. You can see the little triangle with the California sign underneath it. A lot of these are marketed or manufactured in places that have legalized um, cannabis use and cannabis products. Um, and we see them sort of um, trafficked over to other states or spilling into other states where they have not been legalized. Just because they're developed or manufactured in states where it has been legalized does not mean that they're also safe. That's another misconception. Um, as you're looking at this, I just want you to sort of make a mental note of what you see on the label and what you don't see on the label as well. I have more pictures, so keep looking. Some of these were actual evidence items, again, that we received and tested in our laboratory. So, you'll notice some of them include dosage on them. Um, some of them include how many milligrams. It doesn't say milligrams of what. Um, So, quickly, some of the dangers. I will tell you, all of these products are unregulated. They are absolutely not um, overseen by the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, or any other uh, federal governing authority. So there is no quality control, no specific manufacturing guidelines, um, and no specific manufacturing requirements for what can or cannot be in them. I will say most of the labels lack information or if they have information, it's incorrect. So very, very often we'll test these products and the label will say one thing and we will find several other things that were not um, either intended to be there or not disclosed on the packaging. They don't include any nutrition information, manufacturer information, active ingredient information. Um, <coughs> so, <clears throat> uh, dosage also. Technically, according to and the um, South Carolina Department of Agriculture um, and DHEC have put out a statement saying, I'll just read it to you straight from the horse's mouth regarding manufacture, distribution, and sale of food and beverage products containing hemp-derived products, um, the FDA, US FDA, prohibits the introduction 
of any food which THC or CBD has been added. These are not approved. So, did you catch that? CBD also has not been approved by the FDA to be added to food and beverage products. It is illegal to do that and to market them and sell them. So, just so you know, it's all about making informed decisions, right? Okay, <clears throat> just some quick effects. So, the problem with edibles also, when you're smoking something, the onset, I have two now. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry. you're so kind though, thank you. I'll definitely drink it. I'm trying to move through this quick because I know um, we're almost out of time and I do want to leave question and answer time. So just quickly, the problem with edibles, so smoking, the onset of effect is very rapid. So right, it's being absorbed very quickly into the lung tissue and getting into the blood. With edibles, because you're ingesting it, it has to go through the entire digestive system and be broken down and metabolized. So the onset of effect takes much longer, more like 30 to 40 minutes. So if somebody is to eat some of these edibles and then wait, and then wait, and they're not feeling any kind of effects, what are they more likely to do? Dose again, right? So they take a second dose and now, Five or 10 minutes in, they're starting to feel the effects from the first, but now they've already taken it, so they're more likely to overdose because they've, again, dosed on top of a dose. So some of the um, physical effects that you're gonna notice from somebody under the influence of these, sedation, very lethargic, um, a loss of maybe coordination, um, diminished motor function, slowed speech, disorientation, and even psychosis, that disconnect from reality. Um, <clears throat> I always, always recommend if somebody is experiencing those types of symptoms, um, take them to get evaluated by medical personnel because you don't know how much they've had and if they've dosed on top of dosed, um, they could find themselves in a really um, bad situation very quickly. One last thing, just to mention, um, other non-cannabis edibles. Um, I actually received one of these chocolate bars in the lab. If you notice in the corner there, I don't know if you can read that, it says psilocybin mushrooms. This is a ch chocolate bar, so um, Girl Scout cookie flavored chocolate bar with um, mushrooms ground up mushrooms in the actual chocolate. Um, they did actually contain psilocin, um, like I mentioned before, a schedule one substance, totally illegal, um, but these are out there also. So don't just assume that all of the edibles are just marijuana products or hemp products. Um, there are lots of other mushroom-based substances out there, gummies as well. Um, we just received some of those in the lab. We haven't tested them yet, but I'm anxious to see um, what those actually come out to be. So just know that those are out there also. The end. <laughs> He's back there doing one of these, so. Um, <clears throat> hopefully I gave you a lot of information. Um, even if you already knew some of it, hopefully at least part of it was um, helpful uh, in just understanding the types of substances that are out there. Um, like I mentioned, these are not the, the substances that we grew up with decades ago. Um, so things have changed a lot uh, over the years. Um, so if you have any questions, I'm gonna invite Ashley up to answer them with me. You can just fire away, step up to the microphone or shout really loud. Um, <coughs> happy to address any of your burning questions. I have a question. Yeah. What is the definition of, what is a non-medical prescription? Non-medical prescription. Non-medical prescription. Oh, I think I'm, if I didn't say it Sorry. like this, what I meant is non-medical use of prescription drugs. So using prescription drugs when you don't have the prescription for it. So oh, like else's either diversion or, yeah. So you're either, 
So you're either buying, borrowing, stealing, yeah, using pills. It should have had the word use in there if I forgot to put in my PowerPoint, non-medical use of prescription pills. I'm not always accurate with my typing. <laughs> yeah? What are you seeing in our schools today? <clears throat> I think some of the SROs can uh, speak to that for sure, but what we get submitted to the laboratory, I can tell you we're seeing a ton of vape pens with THC in them, a lot of edibles, I will say a significant increase in the number and type of edibles that we're getting. We used to see traditionally um, more of the homemade type edibles, like brownies or cookies that came from somebody's kitchen. Now we're seeing a lot of the products that are manufactured like in California, Colorado, some of those other states flooding over into our jurisdiction. Um, yeah, so lots of edibles. Yeah, so we have had situations like that. Um, it's not totally unheard of. Um, I always tell people, if you didn't open the package and you don't know exactly what it is, don't eat it. Just politely decline. <laughs> Say no thanks. <clears throat> Do you want to take that one? Sure. You do. Um, no drugs are healthy for um, young people or adolescents with developing brains, and each drug specifically probably has its different risks. But overall, I think it's safe to say that, and we know with cannabis particularly, um, you were talking about, um, Tara was talking about some of the risks that we have for attention, for learning, for retention of new knowledge. Um, we know that there's academic effects um, from cannabis, specifically um, mental health wise, we've seen um, psychosis, I think schizophrenia has um, some impact there um, from heavy use. So the age of onset for use seems to matter when it comes to significant health. I mean, I'm not just talking about some depression and anxiety, which, you know, traditionally people have felt like their anxiety might be helped by using marijuana, but in fact that today's strains of it, because they have such high THC levels, that heavy use may be inducing um, some mental health disorders for young kids. And that may be because of the interaction of that de brain development and it not happening um, in a natural way because of the the way these chemicals are working. So, did you do you want to add to that? Um, I would just say, even if we don't consider things necessarily addictive, mm. physically or psychologically, like the use of these products is still creating habits, right? Behaviors become habits, habits become lifestyles. Mm. Um, so, even just getting away from the specific chemistry of it, like that's human behavior, right? Yeah. Um, and we know that. So the sooner we can teach good behaviors and reinforce those good behaviors instead of just sort of brushing off the, well, it's not that bad, it, kids will be kids kind of mentality, yeah. um, I think we can sort of teach our kids to make better decisions and put them on a path for success. Yeah. <clears throat> So many questions. Um, first question, you spoke a lot about uh, Delta 9, uh -huh. THC, not the <laughs> Well, what, what's the difference? Because now we hear about the Delta 8, CBD, <clears throat> THCA, you know, that turns into THC when you actually burn it. Uh -huh. um, so what is the difference between those and what is the danger with them? The second question is, we know eventually marijuana may be legalized here in Sacramento for recreational use. We see a lot of these stores pop up, these smoke shops that actually sell some of these products. What are we doing to combat that, address that, prevent our kids from using this? <coughs> I 
Okay, I'm gonna try to give you the short version um, to not get too nerdy on you. The first, addressing the chemistry. So the marijuana plant has a lot of compounds that we refer to as cannabinoids. Just umbrella, cannabinoids. There are hundreds of them, essentially. So delta-8 THC, delta-9 THC, there are many others, delta-10, delta-6A10A. Um, those are all found naturally occurring, most of them, in the marijuana plant and varying levels. Um, CBD, cannabidiol is another one, cannabinol, um, and it goes on and on and on. Um, like I said, they're all found in the plant naturally occurring, um, and they all have different effects on the body. People hone in on the Delta-9 because it's sort of the most abundant and produces the most significant effects. Um, and so that's, that's why that one in particular um, is singled out. Also, the hemp law specifically identifies the Delta-9 THC isomer as the deciding factor for whether or not a substance is legally hemp versus illegally marijuana. Um, so that's part of the reason that that one is so prominent also. Um, THCA is actually the naturally occurring form of Delta-9 THC in the plant. Um, and when it's heated or burned, it converts to Delta-9 THC. So just a little chemistry conversion. Um, when we do our analysis, we're actually sort of helping that process along. Um, and our quantitation that we do is actually taking both of those into consideration so we get the total THC concentration. So it includes both of those. The naturally occurring form, and we call it the decarboxylated form. So, oh, question number two. Part. Yeah. Um, I get this question from my DARE officers each time a new state <laughs> makes it legal. Um, and they say, what are we gonna do? And um, I say, well, take a deep breath, because we already know what to do. Because we already have alcohol, which is legal in every state, which is still not healthy um, for kids, right? Um, just because something is legal doesn't mean that it's legal for children to buy, doesn't mean it's a healthy decision for them to use it. And we already know how to talk to them about it. Hopefully we're prepared as the presence in their lives to give them good coping skills, to talk to them about um, what our values are, what decision making, what our expectations are. So it's the same advice, right? Yes, it will probably make it more available to them, but we can control whether it's available in our home. We can set the expectation in our home. We can make sure that they have good coping skills, good decision making skills, good resistance skills, good boundaries, good friends, right? So it's the same. The world will change around us, but we have control of our homes and our families. So the same, same. New day, <laughs> different problems. Yeah, one of you. <laughs> Say that a little bit louder. I didn't catch the last part. Can you put drugs in drinks and does it make it more harmful? Is that your question? Yeah. So absolutely, drugs come in lots of different um, forms. They can be pure drugs. They can be adulterated drugs. They can be in um, like food and drinks. They can be put in um, other forms for different types of use. Um, there are lots of ways to introduce drugs into the body, and so food and beverages are just one of those. Um, so yeah, anything that you're ingesting um, is potentially dangerous. We say the dose makes the poison. So even legitimate medications um, that you're prescribed by the doctor um, to use to help you can be abused um, and be harmful if they're not taken um, properly. Yeah, good question. And uh, I'm trying to understand how all of a sudden 
Good for you. Amen. Still, he has asthma. I'll just say part of the problem, a lot of it recently that sprung up is with the Delta 8 THC. So a lot of that stems from the Hemp Farming Act um, because it specifically says hemp is marijuana, um, cannabis sativa L plant with a low Delta 9 THC content. Remember Delta 9 is the isomer of choice. So they're saying, okay, it also includes any derivatives, extracts, salts, isomers, on and on and on. So the farmers say, okay, well, if I take a legitimate hemp plant, legal, extract the CBD from it, legal, convert the CBD to Delta-8 THC, that should be legal, right? It came from a legal source. The federal government says, all tetrahydrocannabinols, THCs, are a Schedule I substance, including Delta-8. So federally, those are Schedule I substances. So the argument from the farmers is, it came from a legal source, it should be legal. So you saw all these vape shops pop up selling Delta-8, Delta-8, it's legal. <clears throat> um, so actually, SLED wrote to the Attorney General asking for their position on the issue um, basically asking, hey, we don't agree with this. We believe that the hemp farming program was never intended to legalize the other isomers, essentially, of marijuana. Um, it was to produce a legitimate agricultural product. Um, and the attorney general gave his position saying basically the same thing, that, oh, they took my presentation down. Basically that, um, their intention was not to legalize all of these other chemicals. Um, <clears throat> oh. There we go. So you can kind of read that. I'll summarize. Um, <clears throat> so I gave the farmer's position. Um, <coughs> the problem is they also say that Delta-8 THC products as long as the Delta-9 it, in it is less than 0.3%, that's still a legal product. It's considered a hemp product. Right, so that's how they're sort of justifying getting away with selling those types of things. Um, 
And our problem, just on our end, and analytically, is a lot of these products are in vape pens, um, food products, those sorts of things. We don't have a method to do quantitation on those types of products. So each one of those different products essentially is a different, we call it a matrix, a different background with those compounds in it. So each one of those would require its own method validation for us to be re reliably be able to say it has less than 0.3% in it or not. Um, and so analytically, we can't really make that determination. Um, so we're kind of in a hard, hard place there. Um, but again, federally, THCs are all illegal, Schedule One, and the Attorney General's position in the state of California, or Carolina, and the Department of Agriculture actually has it on their page, also with the Hemp Farming Act, that Delta-8 is an illegal substance. So they've put it out there. It's illegal. So. encouraged by you. Yeah. Keep fighting the good fight. That's right. That's right. Don't get tired of doing good. Your son is worth it. Yeah, I got it. 
Okay? And deal with the minor fits whether they go into the uh, with the environment and it fits of the under the influence of the drug and things like that. But that's basically how we do it. Like I said, it, it, it goes all throughout the air and it's hard to pinpoint. Let's see which car has it and which car doesn't. So if the other car has it, you put the parking lot and call this whole next two uh, two blocks around. And I'm in the parking lot and see the guy over there smoking. Right. I call law enforcement and right. ask them to search Did they actually came out there and search them? No, I'm in my car and okay. those guys are there smoking. Okay. I'm in, I'm in the parking lot of a shopping center. Right. If I call and say, look, there's a car, tag it so, 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 do the barrel, and we all come. If you witness that, yes, we can follow up on that. Yes, we can. Uh, make sure you give them the information, uh, you know, uh, description and information of what the car looks like and everything. And yes, we can definitely follow up on that. Thanks, sir. Okay? Yeah? We received a lot of information this evening. Will this um, event be posted on the district website for replay at all? Yeah, we've actually recorded the entire thing. So um, it will be posted on the district website. It will be pushed out to you through Parents Square. So okay. even the parents that aren't here can see it. Yes. And then I think we'll also add many of the presentations and the resources I mentioned tonight to the website. Thank you. Okay. One more. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yes, thank you for uh, providing information to all of us. My question specifically is for you. In regards to, yes, we do have boundaries, but when we are aware that these kids being in the school system, when we are aware that they have used or are using, and we observe that, what are the consequences? Okay. I want to thank you as far as the consequences go. We get a charge from having it in our system. That's not a charge. Okay? If they have it, if they're in possession of it, we can. Okay? Uh, our concern would be that, uh, that you know, as far as that medically, we want to get them some assist, medical assistance and help uh, to make sure that they have overdose and use too much over there. But it's very unfortunate that we, uh, as far as SROs, we're kind of in that reactionary position. Okay? Once it's told to us, we react and we kind of go from there. But if we find something on them, then we can't charge them with possession. But uh, as far as just having an assistant, just like unfortunately, kid come on campus and drink. We can't charge them with uh, being under the uh, consumption of alcohol. All we can do is call that parent, and uh, the school has that policy as far as dealing, dealing with uh, that particular child. Okay, well, I've a question from that. So the kid is lethargic, and the teacher or teachers are aware of their lethargic uh, state of mind. Right. First, we've got to call the administrator, make the administrator over there, and get us involved in it as well, too. Okay? And the first thing we we'll do is get them to the uh, nurse. Get the nurse checking out. Yeah. They see if I get that first, well, definitely that person transported. Because you may never know what they're talking about in the system. A lot of times, they don't want to, they don't want to stitch on anybody. They don't want to tell where they got it from. Okay? So what they're going to do a lot of times is say, oh, uh, I just ate some uh, goonies or whatever. Where'd you get them from? Oh, uh, this is something that I had or whatever. And that made me sick or whatever. They don't want to tell them their friends a lot of times. But uh, it's very unfortunate we do have SROs there that can give the assistance that they need. And we got administrators too that will happen. But should they be under the influence, what's the fact that they are under the influence, the schools do have their uh, policies as far as what they can uh, do. Them. But as far as us, we can't uh, charge them for being under the influence of uh, you know, marijuana. Yes. <laughs>